Thank you, Dr. McCray, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is indeed a privilege to uh, be with you tonight, uh, and thank you to uh, you and others, uh, Andrew, for the invitation to spend these days uh, here on the campus. Uh, your uh, welcome was very generous, uh, I might add. It, it did remind me of, uh, I once heard a bishop say that flattery is all right if you don't inhale it. Uh, and I, I have learned that we need to be careful about these things. Uh, but it is a treat to be with you. And uh, one of the expectations for this week will uh, not only be the opportunity to speak, but to interact. And as one who believes in collective wisdom, uh, as we interact with each other, uh, we can gain insight. Uh, that can help us understand these times and live effectively uh, in this age. God's people have a long history of uh, studying the revealed Word of God and focusing on the person of Christ to give direction. Uh, in homiletics courses and uh, in other formal education settings, uh, students are invited to look at God's historical revelation and then make the hermeneutical connections of application into current situations. Uh, that is a right emphasis and one that is needed in the future, but there is a complementary emphasis that will be important for us as we move uh, toward the year 2000 and beyond. It will be critical that we complement the study of the word with the study of the world. Because of what is happening and what will continue to happen in the Canadian context, uh, it will be critical for those of us who have a commitment to ministry uh, to increasingly become good missiologists. That is, we will give extraordinary attention to the circumstances of the times in order to connect the revelation of the word with the reality of the world. In some circles, I listen to people who celebrate what is going on in our society by saying that we are becoming more like the New Testament church. It is true that if we compare uh, the city of Corinth and the circumstances that are there with some of our modern cities in the world. Uh, I'm not sure if Wolfville qualifies for uh, that particular designation in terms of being a modern anyway, My sense is uh, there will be enough worldliness here for uh, ad admission into that very important club in this context. But just to say that although we are becoming more like the New Testament, there is an important way in which we are very different from New Testament times. Uh, the church was born historically uh, into a unique weaving in time. It was a Greek, Roman, and Hebrew moment in time. And uh, the people of God who became followers of Jesus in that first century uh, did so in a multi-minded and pluralistic society, but they did it as members of a minority group. And the, and the big difference between New Testament society and contemporary Canadian culture uh, is a reverse on the minority and majority roles. In the New Testament, the people of God move from being a minority to becoming a majority. In Canadian society, as the people of God, we are moving from a position of social prominence and majority to becoming a minority. And the difference between starting small and gaining a momentum in a culture compared to, in fact, starting large with a dominance and social standing and becoming less and less significant in the culture uh, leads us to a set of circumstances that are quite different from what is going on in New Testament times. With this distinction in mind, we unite with the history of God's people in wanting to be light in the modern world. But I would suggest to us this evening that 
we need to distinguish between being light in the world and understanding that being right will not necessarily equal being light. That in fact, it is quite easy for us to make correct pronouncements, to affirm the historic understandings of God's revelation to his whole creation, to be right, but because of the circumstances of the time, that may not equal light. And so the challenge of people who have a heart for God will be somehow to follow the historical commitment to be light. But we will understand that we will have to look at different methods without the cost of compromising the message. In fact, we will have to learn to be influencers as members of a minority group. And that means that the culture writes the rules and we will need to understand how the rules are functioning from the dominance of society in order to be present in it with a sense of positive influence. Last summer I had the opportunity of visiting Ottawa and took the occasion to tour the Parliament building. Uh, if you have been there, you will uh, remember the ornate library with its beauty and the stature of those buildings somehow uh, help uh, those of us who carry Canadian citizenship to be a little bit more Canadian before we leave. Uh, you are reminded also that the patterns of the past are not necessarily the patterns of the present. Uh, I went up the Peace Tower to uh, look at the city of Ottawa and came back down to the third floor. And there you can visit a memorial chamber which was erected in 1928. As you enter, you see beautiful ornate books and on parchment are written the names of the 65,000 Canadians who died in World War I and the 45,000 who gave their lives on behalf of freedom in World War II. Each day a page is changed in honor of the individuals who had given themselves uh, in history for the present privileges that we enjoy. As I looked around the memorial chamber, I realized that there were a number of inscriptions literally chiseled into the wall. And directly on the center stage wall in full prominence were these words from Psalm 139. Whether shall I go from thy spirit, or whether shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there, if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there thy hand shall lead me, thy right hand shall hold me. And as I read that psalm, I thought to myself that if the chamber had been erected in the 1980s or 1990s rather than 1928, it is highly improbable that Psalm 139 would be chiseled on the wall, acknowledging the God of creation and the foundation of Canadian culture. We simply understand that today is not like yesterday, and that there have been some shifts. And to understand these shifts as macro patterns that show up in our micro worlds can be helpful for us. That is to say, there are circumstances in the culture at large that are inescapable, and that they are powerful in terms of how they impact us as individuals, but also as they affect us uh, as organizations, and particularly churches. One of the shifts from which there is no escape is that there has been movement in Canadian life from the power of the pulpit to the influence of television. If we look historically and think how the country began, uh, in the beginning, Quebec and French-speaking Canadians were in some sense granted to the Catholic Church. And the rest of the country was deeded to the Church of England. But what that meant was, is that from the pulpits of the land, 
when it came to values and morals and ethics and what was right and what was wrong, Canada received its first core culture from the influence and presence of the church in society. Uh, if you uh, watch television, and if you are like 99% of other Canadians, that means that you watch television, uh, you may tune in to the CTV News, and uh, every night at 11 p.m., uh, the introduction to the news begins with the statement, making your world make sense. And then we listen to Lloyd Robertson and Sandy Ronaldo and Eric Mullen helping us make sense out of the modern world. I would suggest to us that if the advertisers had offered this slogan to CTV 10 years ago or 15 years ago, that it would not have been accepted. It isn't that there is some deliberate self-conscious desire for television to seek divine status in society, but previously it would not have been perceived as a meaning system. Now, for fear that I give equal time, I noticed an ad on behalf of CBC in McLean's not that long ago. It was for W5. And in blatant, bold letters in McLean's, the words were stated, moments of truth. It is not to turn television into the evil presence in society. When we look at urbanization, when we understand what is happening to us in terms of, of family structures and family systems, uh, we will understand that there is a convergence of modern influences. But it is to say that in the past, the power of the pulpit shaped the values and ethics and our understandings in the nation. And today, I would propose to you that primarily the social shaping and the reflection of what is going on in Canadian society is best des described by the presence of television. Another macro pattern from which there is no escape is that there has also been movement from the prominence of the institution to the significance of the individual. Historically, again, Canadians were people who believed in institutions. Uh, from the beginning, we had kings and queens, prime ministers, bishops, and instead of sheriffs riding the western ranges to keep law in order, we established the institution of the RCMP. As, as a nation, we were people uh, who believed in peace, order, and good government. We had confidence in our institutional structures. I know our present prime minister is uh, still living with uh, a significant affirmation of the populace. Uh, but if we look deeper, we will understand that there is a basic cynicism in the Canadian psyche to finding solutions in the bureaucratic or seeing institutions as a delivery system for a better world. We see this in patterns that Canadians are joining organizations less and less. Whether it is intramural sports in a high school, hobby and interest groups in a community, or whether we see attendance patterns at the performing arts, uh, Canadians are joining less and constructing their worlds with personal preference more and more. It is to say to us that in this modern age, the VCR is a contemporary cultural symbol. You see, the VCR allows us to do what we want with who we want, when we want. It is an invitation to build our lives in terms of personal prerogative rather than aligning ourselves with organizational life. And so a current pattern which has implication for the church and other institutions and organizations 
is that Canadians today are more interested in the personal than they are the organizational. More inclined to express prerogative from the individual than to give loyalty to the institutional. These patterns previously were held in place by the existence of Christendom. Berger talks about plausibility structures, and by that he means those things in society that we take for granted. The stabilizing presence in a culture, uh, those things that we do not argue about. If we think about what was right and what was wrong in the 1950s and applied that question to sexuality, he in fact understood that sex was to be expressed between a husband and a wife who are committed in a covenant relationship for a lifetime. The family was defined by sociologists as a man and a woman living in a home with one or more children. I would defy you to describe and define a family in such simple terms in modern Canada. See, we have moved from consensus to complexity. An example of that comes to us from the government study on the Royal Commission for Reproductive Birth Technologies. This Royal Commission that spent something in the neighborhood of $26 million eventually produced two volumes, 1,275 pages on how to have children. Uh, 1,275 pages uh, filled with both complexity and ambiguity. Issues certainly relating to in vitro fertilization and surrogacy and cloning and amniocentesis and fetal research and artificial insemination and genetic engineering. How do we define a family? What technologies do we make available to whom? 1,275 pages on how to have babies. I can remember when there was one way to have a child. <laughs> a very fine way. One of God's very best ideas. I incidentally share that with you as a new grandfather who is beaming with a fair amount of pride. But instead of a consensus that was given to us as a kind of gift to the culture from the historic faith perspective, we have a multi-minded society. A society that is not only multicultural, but it's multi-faith, it's multi-family structures, it's multi-gender role, it's multi-career options, it is multi-minded. And for young people in particular, Life is like walking into a music store with a wide array of tapes and CDs. And they say, play me, buy me, try me, experience me. And the wide array of invitations to think and believe and behave come to us without the previous framework for how to think morally and ethically how to believe and how to behave. Scholars are talking about postmodernism being the best way to describe the realities of current culture. But the macro is visiting the micro. These phenomena that exist in the air we breathe, in the television we watch, in the inheritance of the modern world, uh, impact us. The other macro invasion of the micro that I would like to refer to this evening in the first half of this address is to note that in this age we have moved from absolutism assumptions to relativism assumptions. When we talk about absolutes, we are simply referring to the idea that truth existed as an external phenomenon. 
And what relativism does is that it reduces truth to a matter of personal opinion. Relativism exchanges external phenomena for internal. What happens is, is that we move, instead of ap approaching the objective as real, we embrace the subjective as real and give the final vote to personal perspective. In research that we have done over the past 10 years, in yet with, with regard to young people, we have seen the increasing movement toward relativism around questions like what's right and wrong is a matter of personal opinion. Uh, this past summer and again in October, we were part uh, of a national omnibus with the Angus Reid Group, a sample representing 1,500 uh, Canadians, representative of the whole of society, and we asked that question again. And what we discovered in response to the question, what's right and wrong is a matter of personal opinion, that 57% of Canadians agree strongly and moderately with that question. You can see that BC is at 54, Saskatchewan and Manitoba, 59, Quebec is the highest at 65, and the Atlantic promises, provinces uh, fit the Canadian profile at 54. When you look at the age cohort analysis, we realize, as we would expect, that young pe younger people are more enthusiastic about the idea that what's right and wrong is a matter of personal opinion, and older people uh, less so. And in keeping with indicators of compassion, uh, women are more open to that idea than men. What is interesting to do is to take this data and look at it across the church attendance profile. 49% of Canadians who attend church weekly also agree that what's right and wrong is a matter of personal opinion. You can see that as a church is not present, there are increasing levels, but modestly so. In fact, people who never go to church are only at six out of 10. Perhaps it's the occasional visit to church that is not healthy for one's ethics when we look at that particular. And then when we look at the denominational breakdown, uh, six out of 10 Catholics, five out of 10 Anglicans, five out of 10 United, Lutheran and Presbyterian, a little higher. But I think particularly because of the context of this audience and the conservative evangelical setting, it's quite interesting to realize that 46 percent of evangelicals in Canada also say that what's right and wrong is a matter of personal opinion. Now, when we take this same question about the presence of relativism in the modern world as we experience it, and we ask the question, all world religions are equally valid, we have a similar profile in front of us. It is one thing to say that all religions are valid. And I would propose to us that whether we are thinking about Christianity or Buddhism or Hinduism or Islam, that in and of themselves, every religion is valid. In other words, when we understand the constructs of a world religion, to say that it has no right to exi exist or it is invalid in terms of its existence, I would want to disagree with that assumption. Just as other positions outside of the Christian faith have a legitimacy and validity, surely we would have the same understanding of other world religions. But it is when we ask the question, are world religions equally valid? Understanding the perspective here is of Canadians, most of whom identify themselves as Christians, we then see that today's Canadian Christians are looking at all world faiths and seeing them with equal validity. 
one as good as the other, 72% on the national scale. You know, Atlantic Canada is pretty consistent. You can see the age breakdown, the gender, and when we look again at the impact of church attendance, 57% of weekly attenders in Canada, and this is current 1994 data, 77% of monthly are both saying all world religions are equally valid. And then when, when we look at the, the denominational trend, we see Catholics at 78, Anglicans 74, and conservatives again, 45% of evangelicals are saying in modern Canadian fashion, all world religions are equally valid. Now, if we are wondering why uh, the youth culture and other Canadians are becoming tentative and reticent to make truth claims, if we are seeing that there is limited passion in society, if we observe that people are comfortable with contradictions and that there is a relaxedness with ambiguity, it is somehow linked to the reality that relativism is becoming part of the norm of today's world. Well, if that sounds esoteric or a little out of the grasp of everyday life, let me talk about relativism in the context of umpires having a beer after a baseball game. I'm sure this is a mythical experience, but it serves to uh, illustrate the point. It must have been after a Blue Jays game. Uh, but they were down at the bar having a few beers, and they were talking about balls and strikes. One umpire, you know, with a certain sense of purity, leaned back and says on balls and strikes, I call them as they are. A kind of black and white view of the world. The second umpire leaned back acknowledged a touch of relativism and said, I call them as I see them. The third umpire was rather blatant, and he simply said, they ain't nothing till I call them. <laughs> now increasingly, in the realm of ethics and morals and beliefs and behaviors, we are moving toward a society that ain't nothing until it's called by the individual who wants to make the call. My own preference for describing current Canadian culture is to suggest that in the past we did have a Christian consensus in terms not just of theoretical, but an understanding of appropriate behavior. In the present, we are moving toward secular pluralism. We will take time with these terms and to pursue that direction in a later address. But it is to say that the majority of Canadians are constructing their lives with the belief that God is unnecessary. It doesn't mean that Canadians have given up on the idea of God, but they have somehow decided that they can make self-decisions without the need to consult God as an objective reality in their lives. Where does that leave the current Canadian context in terms of the content of religion in today's world? My colleague in uh, some of the research, uh, Reg Bibby, was on a radio station after we released uh, Teen Trends looking at 15 to 19 year olds. And he was talking to some young people and one young teenager looked across at him and said, I come from a religious free home. I'd never heard that expression before. It's something like a smoke-free environment. It's something, you know, where it's not damaging to your health. Uh, it's not oppressive. But in her mind, religion was certainly negative. Uh, religion is not a negative reality for contemporary Canadians. 
as woeful as we may think the world is becoming, or as you may think I have described it, the Canadians are still very open to God. Uh, they still have a belief in the supernatural. Uh, we can uh, see that uh, by looking at 1991 Canadian stats uh, census data and realize that we still have 82% of Canadians who call themselves either Protestants or Catholics. Although in 1971, only 1% of Canadians said they had no religious affiliation, that has increased to 13%. And as uh, prominent as other world faiths are becoming in the media and other places, there are still only 3% or approximately 1 million Canadians who identify with a world faith uh, outside of a Christian framework. And you can see that 1% identify as Eastern Orthodox and 1% as Jewish in Canadian life. What becomes apparent very quickly, however, is that although we continue to have very high affiliation levels, we know that attendance levels have been declining in terms of actual participation in church life, particularly since the 1960s. And I would propose to us that although Canada's Christian statistical indicators remain relatively stable, the social influence of the faith is in decline. Now, if we take that premise that it is that we have religious roots that continue to be a part of Canadian reality, we need to affirm that and to understand the significance of continued affiliation. But what I hope we can discuss this week is that we don't overinterpret the significance of affiliation without participation, or we don't applaud with too much enthusiasm what is sometimes acclaimed as privatized spirituality. And one of the ways for us to begin to think about this is to Look at how Canadians respond to the question, my religious faith is very important in my day-to-day -day life. This particular question in research terms becomes a predictor for how Canadians demonstrate attitudes and behavior that we would understand to be solidly Christian. For when we have a high response on this particular question, it predicts other substance responses to other spiritual issues. You can see that one out of three agree strongly that my religious faith is very important. BC is the lowest in the country, and as we move to the east, we see that Atlantic Canada stands at the highest uh, in the nation. And this is not all that unusual that often we have uh, a more conservative society continuing to exist in Atlantic Canada. We often have to kind of do an end run around Quebec on uh, conservative issues. On this particular instance, we still see uh, the remaining influence of the Catholic Church in Quebec society, uh, keeping the level as high as it is. You'll note the radical difference between young people at 22% and uh, those who are 55 years of age or older. And it is almost alarming to realize that you have four out of 10 um, females in Canada affirming faith in a connection with everyday life, whereas only 26% of males in Canada make the same response. And here is where church attendance is making its mark in a very decided fashion. Although 33% nationally give this kind of value, only 79%, or pardon me, 79% who attend weekly, but you can see the fall off on monthly, occasional, and never. And as you would expect, uh, we have a fair amount of parallel between mainline denominations 
and it is the conservative evangelical churches that are engendering in the life of their people enthusiasm about my religious faith is important in my day-to-day -day life. What we have is a way of looking at Canadians and realizing that uh, many Canadians are high on God, but low on the church. In the study that was referred to, Where's a Good Church?, uh, we developed a cultural segmentation uh, to help us understand Canadians in relationship to the church. We looked at four categories to help us uh, frame that picture. The first group are the committed participants. Uh, they link with the conditional participants as people who are active participants in formal church life. They represent approximately 25% of contemporary Canadians. Now, the committed participants distinguish themselves from the conditional in that they are formal members of a local church, and they also identify with a denomination, particularly of the church they attend. Uh, these are people who attend frequently, uh, when there are needs at the church, they give their time, they give their money. Most of these committed people even go to business meetings. <laughs> Clergy love these people. And you cannot have a strong church without a core of the committed participants. Now, approximately 25% of the participants that is, 75% of the 25% of the who attend church regularly are committed, but 25% of the attenders are beginning to fall in what we call the conditional participant group. These people who go conditionally have probably switched churches. They are more interested in local participation than anything beyond their local situation. They feel less close to the church they attend than the committed, and they are more inclined to think you don't need to go to church in order to be a good Christian. And when it comes to a second choice to be involved in a small group, and I'm taking this now from 1994, the Angus Reid data I referred to earlier, 47% of the committed participants get involved in a small group, a Bible study, a ministry service group, prayer group, some kind of second choice, whereas only 13% of the conditional participants are involved in any small group uh, participation in the church. There is a problem. And the problem precisely is, is that the committed participants do not like the conditional participants. In fact, the committed participants sit around at business meetings or sometimes around coffee tables, and they say about the conditional participants who come on Sunday morning at their leisure and preference, I wish they were more committed. What they are saying is, I wish they were more like me. And what is happening is, is that the conditional are feeling what we call bad vibes from the committed. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we need to think about this. When you have a minority of people going to church in a culture, is it not fair to conclude that anyone who comes to a church is serious about their spiritual journey? And we will, we will help the future of our churches if we can talk to the committed and tell them to stop sending those negative messages to people who aren't as committed as they are. We can follow that up later in this week. We have world religions, which we need to acknowledge in terms of their present tense status in Canadian society. They would be part of others, but the third category to focus on are what we have called cultural Christians. Cultural Christians represent approximately 65% of 
Canadian society. They represent the majority. Uh, they will be linked uh, tomorrow evening in what I would call uh, cocooners in the culture. But uh, cultural Christians are people who identify with a church denomination, but they do not participate. They are people who are ready to use the church when it comes to rites of passage. So what's happening is, of the 82% of the who say, I am a Catholic, I am a Protestant, we have almost 65% of that 82% who see the church as a place to serve their desire for the sacred at the special moments of life. These are the same people who, when we ask the question, do you agree or disagree with the statement, I am not a Christian, they disagree. They say, don't tell me I'm not a Christian. Because in their identity, they see themselves as Christians and they expect to use the church as a place to receive rites of passage. I have a clergy friend who looks at this group, you know what, says to me, these people wouldn't attend church regularly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and he is right. Because in a cross-tab analysis, what we now understand is that 87% of people who see the church as a place for rites of passage also agree with the statement you don't have to go to church to be a good Christian. You see, what the majority of Canadians have done is that they continue to look favorably at the church as an extension of God's presence in the culture, but they have downsized the church in order uh, that it can serve their particular purposes. In fact, people who use the church for rites of passage are predictably people who will not attend regularly. And there will have to be another way to contact those people in meaningful ways if they are going to become a future part of organized religious life. We then noted the religious nuns, which represent 13%. Before we look at them a little more specifically, it is also to understand that when we look at that contingent of Canadians that identify themselves as atheists or agnostics, the sum total out of 27 million Canadians who say, I am an agnostic or I am an atheist, is approximately 35,000 people. 35,000 out of 28 million say, I am someone who consciously contends that God does not exist, or I do not believe it is possible to either affirm or disprove God's existence. It is to say to us, ladies and gentlemen, is that Canadians continue, in a sense, to be high on God. They do not have God grudges on their shoulders. There is openness to the supernatural. Now, when contemporary Canadians talk about belief in God, I am not proposing to us that they embrace an orthodox view of the Christian God as we would define that. But they are in expressing an openness. The people who live next door to you, the people that you work with, the people that you know by name, they are open to God. In fact, when we control for those Canadians who say they are religious nuns, that is, they do not identify with a church, that 13% I refer referred to earlier, in my view, Jesus Christ was not the Son of God. Now, that's stated negatively to, in fact, dig beneath the surface. So we have 54% of Canadians who say they have no religion who are still saying, well, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. 36%, I feel God is the source and sustainer of everything. One out of four religious nuns say to us, I believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. Two out of ten claim to have an intense, intense personal relationship with God. And 
three out of ten, continue to say, as far as I'm concerned, I'm a Christian. Now, what this group has done is that they have separated themselves from organized religion. But in up to 25% or more, they have reserved a place for the continued presence of God in their lives. We began uh, this evening by uh, thinking about the memorial chamber and Psalm 139 being chiseled uh, on uh, the wall in the Peace Tower. We ask the questions, uh, how can we be light uh, in the current context, in the current religious milieu in Canadian society? Uh, we will follow up on the question of being careful to be both right and light in a pluralist society in subsequent lectures. But I would like to close by making three very brief suggestions. The first is that in these 1990s, as we seek to be better missiologists, it will be important for us to assume the posture of St. Francis in his marvelous prayer when he said, Grant that I may not so much seek to be understood as to understand. We will not increase the possibility of our churches to be effective uh, by simply articulating what we believe more loudly as we reach to the people in our lives, as we sensitize ourselves to our communities, as we see that religious roots almost continue to reek in the culture, we will then, I think, move to people around us uh, asking questions like, uh, what is your religious background? And out of soliciting that kind of question, we can listen to why people have left the church, but we will also discover they continue to hang on to positive views of God the Creator and Christ the Redeemer. But if we do not take time to assume the posture of St. Francis, grant that I may not so much seek to be understood as to understand, but we will not hear those voices we will not sense where people are. We will also, I think, need to be encouraged at the fact that there, is, there are profound levels of spiritual openness in contemporary society. There is more spiritual openness today than there has been any time uh, in, in the last uh, several decades. And part of that is because we have dethroned the rational, and opened ourselves up to reality beyond cognitive control. And that has opened the door to pursuit of the spiritual and interest in the spiritual. If we have eyes to see and ears to hear, we will even read novels like Douglas Copeland and hear him speak on behalf of Generation X, I tell it to you with an openness of heart that I doubt I shall ever achieve again. So I pray that you are in a quiet room as you hear these words. My secret is that I need God, that I am sick and can no longer make it on my own. I need God to help me give because I no longer seem to be capable of giving, to help me be kind as I no longer seem to be capable of kindness to help me love as I seem beyond being able to love. And so as we listen to people around us and as we see spiritual openness that is present around us, may we also 
in relationships with people around us, position ourselves for what will be an exploding discussion and debate on ethical, moral, and lifestyle issues as we move into our future. The change in thinking about sexuality, the reordering of what we assume to be good, right, better, and best is an opportunity for us to engage the culture with what is the good, the right, and the best. But if we move into the future, believing that our way is the only way to think, believe, and behave, we will chase people away from us, away from our churches, and away from the God who created the world and the Christ who died to redeem the world. Now, this is a day for us to engage in the debate, but to do so with an understanding that as God gives to us the invitation to believe and behave in obedient response, that he gives to others the choice to believe and behave as they too choose to believe and behave. And so it is in this multi-minded society that we seek to lift up the historic Christ and the God of creation. And it is our privilege to make sense of who God is and what Christ has done. May God help us to be faithful in this moment in time. Thank you.